Azim, it is so good to see you. How are you doing, Dr. Short? It's been way I'm, too long. I know, I know. It has. It has. It's so good to see you. It really is. How have you been? I've been all right, you know, just working. Um, I still can't, I was thinking about it today, right, as I was trying to prepare some thoughts uh, for today's panel. Like, I can't believe it was eight years ago. <laughs> but, I, but I tell you this, though, I tell you this. Out of all my educational, higher educational experience, including law school, you're the most compassionate mentor throughout my academic experience. Thank you. you know? And I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Wait, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I, wait a minute. I can't because I have a story. Like, your introduction is not going to be my typical standard introduction because I, I definitely have a story. And and I think that's why I do what I do in reference to SPOP because of something that you did. And I don't even know if you know the impact that you had on someone else, but it was a year later, this was a completely different person. Like, Man, I don't even. I know. I hope it's not an embarrassing story. You know? Oh no, absolutely not. No, I asked you to do something. You were just like, sure, no problem. You might have been in your second year of law school. I might have been the first year. I don't even know. But I don't know what you said. But man, it was powerful. So that's what I'm going to say. That's all I'm going to say. That it was powerful. Um. Everyone, we do have a couple of individuals who, um, so let me do a, a check in. Tina, have we heard from P Preeti and how she's doing? Did she arrive in Nepal and how's her dad, her mom, I mean? I uh, haven't heard anything yet. I'm not sure about um, those on her committee. All right. Azim, we have 11 ambassadors, um, but as you can imagine, life has a way of getting involved. Of course. And we, I know one is traveling due to health issues with a mom. Somebody is going to be late. I think Diana had a conflict. And it's Friday, and I want to be respectful of people's time. Yeah, it's fine. So what do you think? You want to postpone this? No, we're mm -hmm. going to go through it. We're going to record it, and we're going to go through it. They'll get it. Those uh -huh. who are not here um, will get a chance to see the video. Um, so <sighs> Rosalind says she's going to be late. Preeti is... Um, I think out of the country. Um, Diana Jones sent me a email. Sakina, can you reach out to everybody else? And Effie is sick. Yep, I'll reach out now. We're waiting for Usfa. Azim, how did you, well, you know what, I'm not going to ask that question because I'm sure it's part of your remarks. I was going to ask you, how did you end up in the city of Newark? Well, it, it is going to be part of my, one of my remarks. Um, networking. Literally, I had one of my friends was a, for, a former attorney here. She had a position uh, doing educational law, and she made one call to the chief of staff, and on Monday, she called the chief of staff. On Friday, I was hired. No. Yeah. You know, um, that's literally how it happened. It's, it's funny. You can, you can go to Harvard Law School. You can go to whatever law school. It doesn't matter. All that matters is who you know and the meaningful relationship that you have. You know? Yep. Absolutely. Yeah, but it's, it's, it's been crazy here in Newark. Like, Every, all the every corporate day. proceedings are done yeah, every day. Corporate proceedings are done through, uh, you know, Zoom, and it's just strange, you know? Yeah, but. it really is. One, two, three, four, five, awesome. Effie. All right, so Effie is sick. 
Azim, I don't even know. We're we're not going to reschedule because I can only imagine what your life is like. And we and all of our events get recorded, so they have an opportunity to see it later. Okay. Well, but if you do um, need to postpone it, it's okay. With you. you know, um, I just want to make sure that your program benefits. Uh, so I can, uh, but I'll make time if that is a concern. You know. Um. I'm going to leave it. Ambassadors, what do you think? It's up to you. Um, I have no opinions about it. I mean, like, some of us are here, so, you know, I'm interested in hearing, you know, Azim's story, but uh, at the same time, you know, I do want to be accommodating of others, but I also worry about, you know, as the semester progresses on, you know, will people's availability continue to dwindle? So a part of me is kind of leaning toward keeping it today, if, if that's all right with everyone else. Yeah, I'll echo that. Our classes are just going to keep getting more intense in November. So. <laughs> <laughs> how are you guys holding up with this? I mean, I don't even know how college is continuing through Zoom. And how. We're it's not. It's not great, but <laughs> it's, it's doable. <laughs> how, I, I don't know. I, I can't even understand it, you know? But I hope this, hope we go back to normal soon, which I don't think we will, but. And so, Azim, I do a monthly um, professional development session with them for an hour on Saturday. And it, a week ago, the hour, 30 minutes of it was talking about self-care because this is more exhausting. This is actually more exhausting than being in the classroom and in the office. And I don't know about anybody else. I definitely know I'm feeling it. Um, I think I'm working harder now than I probably ever did if in years. Right. And, and at a much faster and more intense pace because you have to think through every single aspect and not being able to walk down the hall into somebody's right. office and say, hey, let's do, 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 do this. And so, yeah, it's definitely taking its toll. I had an event scheduled. I had an event scheduled in November. I canceled it. One of my events, I was just like, I can't. Like, I just don't have the capacity. We hadn't put the proper planning into it. I had already scheduled a series of events. Nope, I canceled it. I was just like, you know what? We can do this in the spring. Yeah. So I just don't have the capacity anymore. So with that being said, we're going to get started. Am I the only panelist today? You're the only panelist. It's Man, all it's a lot of pressure. <laughs> I was hoping I could stay quiet for most of it, but uh, no, no. But wait a minute. It's it's going to be it's going to be nice because it's a. The goal is to have a more intimate conversation, and I actually really do like that. I really yeah. do appreciate that. I feel like I yeah. can actually talk to you. It will be more of a dialogue as opposed yeah, to yeah, yeah. So and so I'll talk of that you hear a little bit about that in our in my remarks. All right, let me start the recording. Good evening everyone. My name is Sharon Stroy. I am the Director of Public Engagement in the School of Public Affairs and Administration. This is the second professional development session for the SPA Ambassador Program. Our SPA ambassadors are currently the inaugural cohort, brand new for the School of Public Affairs and Administration. They are, what I can say, are dynamic. The only thing I can say is absolutely dynamic group of students that is helping us put some infrastructure in place to really say we are a SPA family. You know, Dean Minifil um, has been at the School of Public Affairs now his fourth year. And he says we're a spa family. The one thing that I can honestly say about these spa ambassadors is that they are putting things in place to really make us a community for the students, the faculty, and the staff. And so when we decided to create the spa ambassador program, we wanted to make sure that they got something out of it. And one of the things is to have a networking opportunity to talk to our impactful alumni. Like our alumni, I think is absolutely amazing. 
And so I'm always going to continue to reach out and reach back. So SPA Ambassadors, I would like to introduce you to Azeem Chaudhry. But let me tell you a little bit about Azeem. Azeem was an undergrad student. He was a double major in public and nonprofit administration. It might have been called public service at the time uh, before we changed the name of the major and philosophy. So he was a double major in philosophy. He knew he wanted to go to law school. And so, but the one thing that I appreciate about Azeem is that he was always open to supporting the program, to talking to people about the program, but he also gave back to the program. And I'm gonna share two short stories that really left, it left an impact for me. One of the things that um, Azim did, he was a philosophy major and he was great at it. I was impressed that he was good at philosophy because I thought it was probably one of the hardest classes I ever taken in undergrad. But he enjoyed it, he did well in it, so well to where he was invited to a conference with the faculty members. But when he came back from the conference is what he shared with me. He learned about the history of the IQ exam and how the IQ exam was the foundation for all of these standardized tests. And he shared with me how this, the IQ exam was actually the originator was flawed in its design and how it actually led to this gap in when people of color took standardized tests. It was so amazing that that information that he shared. So I'm the assistant dean for undergrad programs and he was educating me. So it allowed me to look at when students complain about standardized exams. Well, let me tell you what I learned from a student and go do your own research. And so it was just so, it made a difference when students walked into my office stressed out about the GRE or they need to take the LSAT or they need to take the GMAT. That little bit of information that Azim brought back was really impactful in my advising um, in what I did with students. But the second story is why it's important to always talk about spy family. Azim graduated four years and got into law school, Rutgers Law, and I had a student. She was a junior, completely confused about what she wanted to do. She was originally a criminal justice major and she wanted some advice about going to law school. I said, well, the only person that I know is a young man who was a spa major. I did an email introduction and introduced the two of them. Now, we're talking about first year of law school, which has a tendency to be brutal. Um, but Azeem made time, met with the young lady, and I said to her, before you decide to change your major from criminal justice to public and nonprofit administration, Go and have a conversation with this young man. She came back into my office on fire. Not only did she change her major to public and nonprofit administration, she added philosophy as her second major and changed her major and knew she was on her way to law school. Two semesters later, this young lady who walked into my office confused, stress, didn't know the direction. A year later, I didn't recognize her because she walked in such confidence and was ready to go to law school. She had gotten an internship with a law firm. The, the way she sat in my chair was absolutely amazing. And I said, you have actually found your purpose and what you were supposed to do. But it wasn't anything that I said. I didn't give her any good advice. I just sent her to a young man who I thought was pretty intelligent because he was getting AIDS in his philosophy courses. And I just thought he was a good human being. But when she came back into my office, she was almost banging on the desk. Okay, where's the paperwork? I'm ready to go. And I'm picking up philosophy as my major in her junior year. This is why I believe in all my heart that our SPA alumni 
are absolutely amazing. And so we're going to have a conversation. And you'll get a chance to hear Azim's story and what happened after he graduated from spa and law school. So it is my pleasure to introduce Esquire Azim Chaudhry. Thank you so much, Director Troy. Um, well, uh, that really touched me. Thank you so much. Um, but I do want to tell the rest of the uh, spa ambassadors, first off, congratulations for being selected into this program. Uh, it seems like Director Troy and other leadership members at SPA have really taken a lot of time in developing this program. And honestly, you guys are the inaugural cohort. That is incredible. You know, you're, you have the opportunity to leave a legacy. You have the opportunity to develop something and have this program grow. I know myself when I, I and Director Troy, correct me if I'm wrong, I think we were the first undergraduate uh, cohort to graduate, right, for SPA. And I felt so much pride in that. And I want you guys to know that you guys should feel so much pride in being selected in this program. It's incredible. Um, when Director Troy reached out to me and told me to do this program, I would speak um, for one of the panels for this program. I felt incredibly privileged. You know, um, Director Troy can tell you that you know, sh I helped her a lot, but the truth is this, and I'm telling you, all my other friends, right, they would go down to, I forgot what building it was, um, but it's basically where financial services is, or the financial aid office is, and they would get, um, uh, you know, have sessions with their advisor, right? With me, with my sessions, right, were completely different from theirs. They're going there, I'm like, oh yeah, it was like two minutes long. I'm like, really? I just literally spoke to Director Shoy for like two hours. We talked about family, talked about food, we talked about where I, what I want to do in life, and what classes I'm taking. But that's the kind of person Director Shoy is. And, and she's right to say that spa is the family, but a family is nothing without their mother. So thank you, Director Shrey. All right. Um, but yeah, so you want me to tell my story? I, I'm sorry. We're, we're going to make this. You guys take your thing off mute. We're going to make this a dialogue. I want to have, I don't do well just speaking. So what, talk about why law? And you knew, what you knew you wanted to be a lawyer. So why? So, so I'm ha first off, I'm happy this is a very personal, intimate setting because I, I, I this is a very personal um, purpose for me. You know, this, this question goes back to something very personal to me. So growing up um, after 2001, we live in a post 9-11 world, right? I'm a Muslim American, I'm first generation, uh, my parents are immigrants from Pakistan. Uh, they immigrated here uh, with my two older brothers in tow. And I, I have an identical twin brother. And my mom was eight months pregnant with us when they came here to the United States. Of course, to, you know, uh, seek out the American dream, if you will. Now, after post 9-11, everything changed. I was only 12 years old, right? Um, I live in a very... Uh, and I can say this, I live in a very conservative Republican town. I see the Biden Harris, so I think I know I'm talking to the, to the right people. But I, I grew up in a very Republican, conservative area. And I lived in the, 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 uh, the projects, what would you call them? Um, Section 8 housing. And after 2001, everything changed, right? Now, you have people discriminating against, you know, my parents, and I don't understand it. I, it's strange to me, you know? It's funny, some, the first time somebody called me a terrorist, I thought they called me a tourist because I was 12 years old. I didn't know what a terrorist was. You know, I'm like, I'm not a tourist. I live here, right? But there were a few events that happened uh, with respect to me and, and my family where I felt like we were being discriminated against, against uh, by the local police officers. And it's, it's interesting because it's, it's incredibly pertinent even now, right? Um, and that's actually why one of the reasons why I work here, uh, but I'll get into that later. But I felt discriminated against. I felt completely, so I, I had no sense of, uh, sense of empowerment with myself. I felt defeated, de uh, defeated and deflated. Um, and as I began college, right, uh, I learned about Thurgood Marshall, where you guys probably know is considered one of the best civil rights lawyers right? Um, he argued Brown v. Board of Education. And I realized that I never 
want to feel that low again. I never want to feel like I don't have any power in a situation. So I decided that the best way to empower myself was knowledge of the law. Being able to go to a courtroom, the way that Thurgood, Thurgood Marshall handled himself and literally changed the entire trajectory of the United States of America by the you know, presidential decision in Brown v. Board of Education, right? Before, before Thurgood Marshall and his legal team in the ACLU or NAACP, schools were uh, segregated, right? But Thurgood Marshall was able to use his knowledge of the law and advocate and make serious change. And to me, I found that incredibly empowering. And I wanted to be able to empower my, not only myself, my, my community, my family, and, and anybody else that feels like they have been discriminated against. Um, I feel like the laws here protect us, Constitution protect us, protects us, but you need attorneys to go out there and, and make those arguments. And I want to be one of those attorneys. So talk about the law school. What is, how, yeah, how does SPA prepare you for law school? Let's talk. So is, is your, first off, law school, does anybody have, is anybody thinking about going to law school here? No? <laughs> that's, that's, a, that's the smartest decision you've made of your life. I can tell you that right now. Um, so, what, so first question, uh, what, prepare, what, what in SPA program prepared me? Uh, for law school. It's actually interesting because one of the professors um, that taught in the SPA program, Professor Ferlanda Nixon. Yeah. I actually, and it's interesting because I met her in 2011, you know, almost a decade ago, and I spoke to her last week. And she was, she had, she had the biggest impact on my trajectory in preparing me for law school. Again, um, I think my personal belief is I, I, I think classes and theory and, and books, they do, they do teach you a lot, right? But I think the real value is in making a good relationship with a professor or a mentor because they, their ability to teach you is infinite. You know, they come with so much experience. So uh, Professor Nixon, Orlando Nixon, um, we met in 2011. I took one of her courses. And I remember during syllabus week, I don't know if you still call it that, um, she spoke about herself and I realized that she herself was an attorney. So I went up to her and I asked her a few questions and I'm like, hey, look, I, I'm thinking about doing it. And, and again, I, didn't, I knew nothing about it, right? And she sat down with me after class for like half hour and, and spoke about her um, trajectory, right? Um, she explained to me how difficult law school could be. And I, in that moment, I'm like, yeah, I got this, right? But when I got to law school, it was different. It was completely different. It was ridiculous. Um, but she sat down and she, she, she mentored me, right? She also told me to look into um, different nonprofit and um, legal, um, or, uh, legal uh, leaders in various communities, and I did. Then after that, and this is like after class, right? After that, she told me to sit down and write a personal statement, not necessarily for law school. I did use it for law school eventually for admissions, but told me to sit down and write a personal statement as to why I want to be an attorney. And knowing your why, right, of what you want to do, to me, I think that's one of the most important things that you can do, right? Um, and it's funny because Professor Nixon helped me so much uh, to the point where she went over like three drafts of my um, personal statement for law school. She went over my resume. She even reached out to uh, one of the admissions committee, committee members at Rutgers Law School and try to sit down and have a conversation with them about me. Um, she was relentless in advocating for me to get into law school. Uh, and it's funny because how, how things worked out, how, how things work out, because a few weeks ago, um, she uh, emailed me and said, hey, listen, can you write me a letter of recommendation? Um, and I'm like, okay, that's, you know, that's interesting. She's applying to be a dean at, at Rutgers Law School. So, I was super excited to write it because I'm like, oh, I have so much to tell, to tell these committee members about, right? And I, I directly emailed the, the chair of the, uh, of the search committee for the dean, and he responded to me, and he said he was looking forward to um, 
looking forward to seeing her applications and speaking with Professor Nixon. But more importantly, the reason why I was able to, to write so much about her um, was because of everything that she did. You know, it, it's funny. I remember one of the stories that, uh, that I, I, I put into that uh, recommendation letter was she literally taught us how to shake hands um, professionally, right? Now you guys can't do that, obviously, because of COVID, but um, which is crazy to me. But, um, but yeah, you know, she she had so, so much of an impact, right? Even during law school, I actually struggled my, my 1L your first year a lot because it was completely different, you know? And again, being a, a minority, being a first generation um, American and being the first in my family to go to law school, you don't know what to expect. 90% of the other kids in, in my class, their parents are lawyers or their cousin's a lawyer or whatever it may be. So I don't know what the hell I was doing. Um, but I, I was able to call Professor Nixon, right? Um, and ask her, hey, I don't know what I'm doing in law school. Can you help me? You know, we, we met up at the Starbucks in Robinson actually a few times too. And she would sit down with me after she was done and have a conversation with me. And that wouldn't have happened um, if I wasn't in, uh, in the School of Public Affairs administration, you know? So literally like, she, the spa became a part of my life even afterwards, you know? It's very special. Law school. Talk about your first year, your second year, and when you passed the bar. Okay. So um, first year, I started law school in 2013, September 2013. Um, I was part of a program. And, and again, you guys mentioned none of you guys want to go to law school, but if you do, this program, it's only at Rutgers Law School. It's the only program in the entire country for any law school. It's called the Minority Student Program. And that program is directly linked to um, the history of the city of Newark, which are the 1967 riots um, uh, in response to police brutality. Um, and I joined that, joined that program again because of um, Professor Nixon. She advised me to. Um, and in that program, uh, it admitted students, uh, law school students, after you gain admission to law school, you gain admission to this program. And this program was developed kind of like this program uh, for students that, um, number one, came were disadvantaged in some way, right? Uh, whether it be through race, ethnicity, uh, socioeconomic status, um, whatever it may be, you were disadvantaged in some way, right? Um, and join this program, and a month before law school actually even starts, you take an entire course like training to, to for the first day of law school. So we actually sat in a class. We had like a mock professor. We had a professor come in and teach us a month before law school even started um, and explain to us how law school works. Um, because again, all the students in that MS, it's called MSP, Minority Student Program. All the students in that program um, were the first in their families to ever go into law school. Some were undocumented immigrants. Um, and it was incredibly empowering to be around through people like that, because I remember this, one of the students, she was an undocumented uh, immigrant, and she gave like the best speeches. And now she's she's an incredible immigration crisis lawyer, you know. And sadly, she's still um, undocumented, right? Because this whole thing's going on with DACA and Trump is a whole different story. But um, but um, yeah, so we had that program. Uh, it helped a lot. But then law, when law school finally started. I was okay with, you know, they give you like 200 pages to read in a week. It's, it's crazy. And it's very dense stuff. You know, it's very, very boring. Um, you know, I went to law school thinking like, oh, I don't know if you guys ever watched a show called Suits. Yeah. So I'm over here thinking like, oh, I can't wait to be Harvey Specter today. Right? Uh-uh. Uh-uh. <laughs> it, was, it was nothing like that. Um, nothing like that. It was in incredibly dense. It was difficult to go through. Um, the workload was very intense. You know, I, you had classes from 9 a.m. every single day, uh, 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. Those are just your classes for the day. And you have like these core classes, of uh, core classes of law, right? Uh, torts, constitutional law, civil procedure, contracts, uh, criminal law, and property. So you take these core classes Monday through Friday, um, every single day from nine to six, right? And then 
that's just a class, right? And then after that, you have to read the stuff on your own time, right? So you have all these dense, um, you have a lot of dense reading material. And the way that law school is taught is through the Socratic method. And I'm pretty sure you guys are familiar with that method, right? Yeah. Um, in law school, it's incredibly unforgiving. So the way they do in law school, it is honestly, to me, it was actually kind of hazy. They, they will, so they, they it was, I'll tell you guys the story. I was so embarrassed. Um, so I'm like reading these cases, right? And I'm struggling to comprehend them. Because, you know, you, the one thing law school does, right, is it, it forces you to think differently about things. It, I, when I walk down the street, I look, oh, that's a law school right there. Oh, that's a constitutional law. But that's the way I think now. What, when, I, when I started law school, they're like break, they're kind of breaking you to remake you, right? And they're teaching all this doctrine, and you don't really understand it on a comprehensive level, or even like in it. I understand law now, like immediately. I understand how things work, right? Um, but when you first start law school, they're just changing the way that you think. Um, and it was incredibly, I found it incredibly difficult. And they also did this, this thing called cold calling, right? So, what cold calling, you guys know what cold calling is? Yeah, right. You guys get cold call? Yeah. All right. So in law school, they do the same thing. And when you get cold called in law school, they make you stand up. So they're, and they're, it's, a, it's like an auditorium kind of scene, right? They make you stand up in front of everybody. And I'm honestly a pretty shy person. Um, they will make you stand up in front of everybody. And the professor will just grill you about one case for like 40 minutes throughout the entire class. You know? And you have to remember, you, I, don't know, I don't know anything. You know, like I, I'm over here just making things up as I go. So this one class, uh, it was contracts, I'll never forget. Um, I got cold called and I didn't read the case. <gasps> <laughs> what, you know, what I tell, uh, have you ever been so scared where your ears start ringing? <laughs> I swear to God, in that moment, I was so scared. My entire, I felt my body literally have a hot flash. I turned red and that's hard for me because I'm brown, right? But I turned completely red. Um, thank you. Um, I turned completely red and uh, I, heard, I started hearing ringing in my ears. And I, I said to the professor, I'm, like, um, I'm not prepared for the case today. Uh, she read me out so hard for like 10 minutes to the point where other students came up, came up to me and um, they, were, they felt really bad for me. So this was like, I, this was like the first month of law school. I remember thinking like, shit. I guess I'm really not cut out for this, you know? Um, I felt completely overwhelmed, um, you know? And, and in undergrad, I felt comfortable with the material, right? I, I, I felt good about it. Uh, I felt like I understood it here. I'm like, man, what is this? I don't understand this. Clearly, I'm not a good student. Uh, I even considered dropping out. Um, it's funny, one of my friends had a dream, right? We were studying together on the weekends and he had a dream uh, I don't know if you guys ever have been to the Center of Law and Justice, but in the bottom atrium, there's like lockers for, for, for the law students. You guys know what I'm talking about? Well, um, so th those lockers, kind of like high school, it's weird, but they were assigned to every, each law student got a locker because his case books were like this fat, right? My friend told me, he was like, I had the worst nightmare la last night. I'm like, what happened? He said, in, in my nightmare, um, students kept dropping out and every time they dropped out, a locker was left open for them dropping out. And every, so he said, he said there was a bunch of lockers left open, but, um, but it was an incredibly difficult time. And I did not do well academically. Uh, and that was the first time I didn't do well. Uh, and it really, really hurt. Um, but I, I, in that moment, I learned the most uh, from law school. And honestly, that's about resilience. Um, I did, I did not do well my first year at all, you know. And honestly, I'll tell you, like, I don't want to sound angry, but don't, I was used to get A's and, you know what I mean, undergrad, I'm, oh, this is cake. And when that happened to me, um, I was, I felt so upset, you know. Um, I wanted to drop out, and I spoke to one of the, one of the deans at the law school and had a, like, long conversation with, about, uh, with her. She said, look, you're in the minority student program, right? You have already gone through difficulties in your life, right? And you have overcome those difficulties to a point where you're literally in law school. 
So just because you get a bad grade, that shouldn't stop you. You should be used to overcoming things through adversity. You know, and that clicked with me. And I'm like, you know what? Bet, I got this. After that, I started doing way better. You know, I went to all my professors and hey, listen, I didn't do well in your in your class. I didn't do well on your final exam. Oh, and check this out. The way that law school grades is is um you learn all this material, right? And they don't have to teach you all the material. You you're responsible for learning it on your own. Um, and then they give you one final exam at the end. That's like five hours long for each class. Uh, and I didn't do well on those. So I went to all my professors and I spoke to them and I said, look, I I didn't do well. What did I do wrong? Number one, we went over the exams, um, my final exams with each one of my professors. And um, I brought, you know, a pen. I always bring a pad. Detroit, Director Stroy actually told me to bring a pad and pen wherever you go, right? And I wrote down all the advice they told me. I'm like, all right, cool. And then after that, I was completely motivated um, to do a lot better. And, and I did. I did a lot better um, to the point where uh, there's like these law reviews in law school. I don't know if you guys are familiar with those. There's law reviews. I actually became um, the editor-in-chief of one of the law reviews. It was actually the one I wanted. It was called Rutgers Race and Law Review, which deals specifically with the intersectionality of race, ethnicity, and the law, right? Uh, which is exactly the kind of area I want to practice. But, and, uh, but eventually, yeah, so things got easier. Um, but yeah, law school was incredibly hard. The day you missed the ball. First, let me ask you, let me back up. How, mm -hmm. how did you prepare for the bar? How long had you studied? Like, what was your study routine for the bar? That was just ridiculous. Um, so, so the first time I took the bar exam, I actually failed it. I failed it by like five points, super upset. Um, yeah, it was, it was really upsetting. Um, so after I failed it, I changed like my methodology up for studying and the way that I studied for it, uh, most when I passed was I, I treated it like a job. I, I didn't work at all. Right. Um, and you take these, you can take a course, it's kind of like, you know, you can take a GRE course that prepares you. They have these for the bar exam. Um, and a few of my friends who did who passed took a certain kind of course. So I dropped my old course and I took their course. And that was actually a great decision because it, you know, it gave me more discipline on, on, on how to, you know, do things or how to structure my day. But I would wake up at like seven o'clock in the morning. I would go to the gym uh, and I would, you know, I, I pray and I meditate in the morning before I start my day, right? To like kind of center myself. Um, I find myself to be anxious randomly sometimes. So I, try, I would try to center myself before I started studying because it was, it was incredibly, um, there's so much anxiety involved, right? It's like, I get, are you telling me I have to take one test for like three days straight and that's going to determine whether or not I become a lawyer after I just put seven years into it, you know? So it was just like, it was a lot of stress and a lot of anxiety. And um, so I, I would do, I would, I would meditate and pray in the morning. Um, I would listen to these motivational videos on YouTube uh, and I would start studying at like 8 a.m. And for the day, I would focus on a certain course and I would stop studying at 8 p.m. So it was like 12 hour days every single day. I would take like a one hour break to like eat something and then watch like an episode of Game of Thrones, something like that, um, just to like de-stress. But then I would go right back into it. And yeah, the, the bar exam was probably one of the hardest things I've ever done. It's, it's almost, it's almost like, um, it's, it's crazy how much information they want you to know mm -hmm. um, by pure memory. How many times did you take the bar exam? I took it three times. Which is actually so, normal. Yeah. So uh, after I graduated law school, again, I'll, I'll get into something personal. Uh, my mother passed away. Mm -hmm. Through like a track, it was just very, it, it wasn't like a terminal illness. She just had a, uh, uh, a, an aneurysm, right? So I, yeah. So she passed away. And then two weeks later, I was scheduled to take the bar exam. You know, so I actually don't even remember taking it at that time. But on the third time, after I gave myself time to recover, grieve, and, um, you know, check back in uh, emotionally and mentally, I was able to pass it. 
Wow. I didn't know that, Adine. I'm sorry for your loss. Um, career. How, so after you pass the bar exam, you become the, the state certifies you to be a lawyer. What, what, did, what was the career trajectory to where you are now working in the city of Newark? And share with them how you got there. Because I don't think everybody was um, on when you shared that. Yeah, of course. Um, so after I graduated uh, law school, you can do these things. They're called clerkships. It's kind mm -hmm. of like a fellowship. You guys know what clerkships are? So I was lucky enough. I did a clerkship with uh, the appellate division, which is you know a higher court. It's like beneath the Supreme Court for New Jersey. And um, I got a great clerkship. I was working in Trenton. And in that clerkship, what you do is you're basically assisting the judge in every single way, right? First, you, you start by just editing and reviewing the uh, judicial opinions, right? That they actually publish and, and they um, and they opine on, right? And then eventually it gradually grows to the point where you're actually writing the opinions. And I think the most that I've learned with respect to the practice of law was at that clerkship. Because at the appellate division, you know, I, I, I got to a point where I was writing the opinions. And I, at the appellate division, when I did my, it was all, by the way, it's only one year long. Um, and after that, you, you get your own, um, you know, you do your own thing, get your own job, right? Clerkship is one year to the fellowship. Um, so I got really comfortable with it. But also I, I stopped, I, I also kind of didn't like um, a certain practice, uh, area of law called litigation, which is pretty much, um, you know, when attorneys, so, so a lot of ha people have this misconception, right? 95% of attorneys never go to a court. Most of the attorneys that practice are contract attorneys, right? Um, they're the, they never go to a court. They're con constantly behind the desk. The other 5% are litigators. They're the ones that actually go to a court and they, they argue motions. They have trials. They submit briefs. Um, it's, it's lawyer, right? What people consider real lawyering. But after, during my clerkship, I was getting tired of it, right? Because it was exhausting. Um, and also too, I, I didn't like the way attorneys treat each other. You know, uh, it's kind of weird. It's, it's weird. Like, you know, you have uh, opposing counsel, right? And some attorneys truly believe that you have to be hostile to um, the opposing counsel. But it doesn't make any sense. Um, so I didn't like that contentious uh, nature of it. So after I finished my clerkship, I took time off to study for the bar and I consulted. So I didn't, I, I did stuff that was related to the law, but I wasn't, I, I didn't want to be an attorney anymore at that point. Uh, I, I didn't feel good about it. It was, it was uh, during my clerkship, that's when my mother passed away and it kind of changed me. And I'm like, yeah. I don't want to be an attorney. I don't really, you know, um, it doesn't make me happy. Uh, so. I took some time off and finally when I got to a point, I'm like, all right, I'm going to take the bar exam again. And I was consulting at a tech uh, company that entire time. This, this tech company, they, I actually didn't know what the hell they did, uh, but there's like, these, they have these, I don't know if you guys heard of data centers. Mm -hmm. they, yeah. So whatever those are, right. They're just like a room with a bunch of computers that have a bunch of lights. Right. Um, so what I did for this tech company was I uh, helped sh uh, sh I gave them legal structure with respect to um, corporate formation. So this goes into like the contract attorneys and, and um, corporate lawyers. Uh, so what they probably primarily do is they set your company up, right? Um, using like obscure laws and, and exceptions and loopholes and they make it so you have no, you have limited liability, right? You have less fiduciary duties. It's kind of, actually kind of horrible, but, um, and uh, you, you, uh, you avoid paying taxes as much as possible, right? So I did that for like a year. Um, I didn't like that either. So I took the bar exam and uh, I passed, which was, it was really good. It felt really good. It felt like a moral, it felt like a personal victory, not necessarily for a career. And I reached out to one of my best friends, um, Omar Barenzo. He, we went to law school together. Um, still one of my best friends. And I called him. I'm like, hey, listen, uh, I just passed the bar exam. What do you think? He's like, okay. He's like, I I'm going to call Alana up. Alana was the person I spoke about earlier. Um, she was an attorney here. 
uh, at the law department, at the city of New York law department. She was, uh, our title is assistant corporation counsel. Um, so th that's what she was. And she was, she was like, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to call Alana. I think the city of New York is hiring the law department. What do you think? I'm like, okay, that's fine. Um, Alana calls me up like an hour later. She's like, so you want to work here? I'm like, what do you, how do you like it? You know, because within the scope of my duties here, I felt uncomfortable coming here because uh, initially, because I represent police officers in civil rights violations, in, in, in civil rights cases, right? I do tours and, you know, I, I, I do litigation. I, it's funny, I actually, I'm, I do litigation. I hated it before, now I actually enjoy it. But, um, so I felt very uncomfortable coming here. So I wanted to talk to her beforehand. And, and then, again, you know, this was just even, I didn't, I didn't think I'd get a job. But um, I spoke to her, you know, I'm like, hey, listen, isn't it kind of weird? Like, you defend police officers that uh, allegedly violate people's civil rights. And, and what that means in the real sense is what happened to folks like Breonna Taylor, to George Floyd, and countless people of color that have been the subject of police brutality. You know, I felt very uncomfortable. Um, but after I spoke to her, she made me feel better about it. She's like, you can't look at it like that. Um, yeah, you're going to have to re represent these officers, right? And, and yeah, maybe it goes against your personal belief because you want, you want them, you want that plaintiff who got shot 15 times to, you know, get a million dollars, right? You want them to be some sort of um, consequences for the uh, officer, that, officer that did this. But she also worked on another case. Um, it was actually a really, really big case. It went to New Jersey Supreme Court. I, I had the uh, privilege of working on it with one of the, uh, the second highest attorney um, in the law department. And so what that basically, what that case was ongoing for a few years, but uh, the city of Newark created something called the Civilian Complaint Review Board. Uh, has anybody, have any of you guys have heard of it? So it's, so it's, it's, it's the coolest, it was, it's incredibly important, right? So what does it do? Um, it is a review board created that consists completely of civilians or the people of the city of New York. And what are they, and what are the powers and what is this review board for? They are able to um, review police misconduct. They're able to hack hearings. They're able to, they are, they are essentially the um, practical watchdog of, um, the practical watchdog of the police department. Because, you know, police say, we can, the police can police the police. No, they can't do that. So the mayor, um, who is an incredible mayor, by the way, and that's another reason why I work here is because, you know, after the George Floyd um, incident, it's incredibly heartbreaking, um, the mayor, uh, Mayor Ross Baraka, you know, it, it was during COVID, right? And I, I, I checked my phone and I, and I read the, and I read an article and what I saw was the uh, Mayor Ross Baraka, the director of the police department, uh, of public safety, which is he's the director of literally the fire department, e, uh, EMS and the police department. Hi, so they were out in front of city hall with a bunch of protesters in front of the steps and the mayor and the director of uh, uh, public safety were taking the knee, right? Um, and those are the reasons why I wanted to, you know, come to this place. But anyway, my decision in, to answer your question, I, I'm, I'm going on tangents, and right, I'm sorry. But to answer your question, the first decision I made was, do I really want to work here? And after that conversation with my close friend, uh, who was also one of my law school classmates, um, I was convinced that I really wanted to do it. And then literally on Monday, I said, uh, she texted the chief of staff. Um, he, he responded back the next day and she told me to send my resume and a cover letter and, and I writing something. And I did. And then on Thursday, I had an interview and they hired me on the spot. The interview. Um, that's how I knew this place was good for me because I, I, again, I spoke about very personal things I, uh, about what my, I feel like my purpose is and why I wanted to come to the city. Um, but that's how I got here. Wow. Wow. I have asked more than enough questions. I now want the ambassadors to ask 
the last 15 minutes to ask some questions or thoughts, <laughs> reflections. What resonated with you? Anything? Um, oh, who said something? It was me. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so the, what, the thing that like immediately pops uh, to my mind um, is, you know, how you reconciled, um, like the, the mixed feelings about doing that work. Um, and so like, are, are you just starting there or have you been, have so you I've been here for about a year and a half. Okay. Um, so I've been here about for about a year and a half. And so I'm, uh, so I work in the litigation section. There's various sections within the law department. There is a labor section, which primarily deals with disputes between um, employees and management, right? Mm -hmm. Kind of like, you know, you, so when, you, when you're a government employee, you have a constitutional right, a uh, property interest um, in your employment. So anytime, a, uh, anytime the city wants to fire you or um, let you go, you have to be given a hearing. To, uh, to make sure you don't offend somebody's constitutional rights, right? So mm -hmm. there's a lot. There's labor department. There's a, there's various other departments, contracts, legislation. So the litigation section is the only one that deals with these calls, um, and it's it's for these really difficult cases. And one of one of the cases I'm working on right now, as the African American male, he was he was shot. It was 90, not 90, 90 zero bullets fired. Um, six police officers and uh, he was shot 18 times and he survived um, but yeah it's very difficult to to, to, to deal with these um, cases right because a lot of times the plaintiff uh, their you know their story is closer to, to yours than the officers right mm -hmm. the color of your skin is closer to yours or it is you know they look like you, right so there's sympathy there but in this position, I'm able to speak to these officers, explain to them, hey, the hell are you doing? I read them out. You know, I will read, I will read the police officer out. Because I feel like that it's uncomfortable sometimes, but sometimes you need to do that. Right. And and that, that's one of the one of the things when you know you work for an institution where you don't feel like has has done justice to the people, you join the institution, maybe you could do something on the inside, right? Mm -hmm. Um, because I think truly. Police brutality is, 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 is it's another two hour uh, another two hour yeah. webex right there, but I think it comes down to culture, and that culture has been developed over mm -hmm. century. But I'm sorry, I didn't even answer your question. What was your question? Um, like that was essentially it, like just like how you um like reconcile that within yourself um because I I've had a position like that um, working for a charter school um certain practices that didn't jive with me on a personal level um, right it was my job to do it um so i was just curious of how you i guess not separate the two but like how you well, reconcile yeah, separate um you mm -hmm. know like your personal feelings from you know doing doing your, your job yes it's the um it's difficult, you know, it's something that I battle with actually every day, right? Um, but for example, like uh, as an attorney, I'm like a civil service employee and I really wanted to wear a BLM face mask, right? So so just making that decision in itself was an entire internal discussion, mm -hmm. right? Can I do this? Am I espousing um, a political belief when I shouldn't be um, in, in this profession? Maybe I can, can I even wear it in city hall? I do want to wear it in city hall. Um, because I want to, because I, I want to be able to express um, my sentiment, right? Uh, so yeah, it's a battle every single day, right? And and it, again, like and you mentioned this, and I think you have the right idea with respect to this. A lot of it comes down to compartmentalization, right? Mm -hmm. um, being able to separate and um, you know keep keep your parts of your life in different boxes, right? Um, when it when it comes to uh, these cases, uh, I, I still feel, I get emotional about it, right? I get upset, I get angry, you know? Uh, and it's okay to feel that, right? As long as you don't show it in the courtroom or, you know, um, 
you're able to sit down and, and reflect and think about why you feel this way or why, you know, why does this piss you off? And it, well, okay, cool. Can I do something about it? I'm in a position of power, now, right? And you mentioned you were at a charter school and you, you didn't feel like, you know, um, it, it didn't, you know, jive with your, with your personal um, beliefs, right? Principles. Um, but also, I challenge you to like, do something about it. And that's incredibly difficult, right? But, but once you're able to do that, I promise you, you'll, you'll feel good about um, being where you are, even though it doesn't necessarily go with your system of beliefs. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. yeah, that makes sense. I have a question. Okay. Um, interestingly, my husband is a municipal attorney and a lot of what you're discussing is conversations we have at our house too. Um, you know, police chief. God bless you. He's an attorney. God bless you. I know. It's hard to be married to somebody who argues professionally, you know. <laughs> um, <laughs> but a lot of things that you're discussing about, like, you know, if an employee wears a MAGA hat, you know, is that offensive to somebody? But then if you ask them to take that off, does somebody have to take off a Black Lives Matter? You know what I mean? Like, right. there's, a, there's a lot of that conversation going on. Um, but my question was, did you go to spa for undergrad because you thought you, like, you knew you wanted to be an attorney. Did you know that you wanted to be working in a municipal space as an attorney? Or did you have different different goals as an attorney? That, that's actually a great question. It's a very, very, very good question. Um, yeah, so when I, when I started at spa as an undergraduate student, actually one of the decisions I uh, one of the reasons why I made the decision to go to spa, spa was because I wanted to be a public service attorney. Um, and I wanted to have uh, a, again, at that time it was called public service, the, the name of the major. So I was like, all right, cool. That sounds good to me. I, I read about it. I met Dean Shore, a director Shore. I keep calling you Dean Shore because that's why I used to call you 10 years ago. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I knew I wanted to be in uh, public service. I wanted to be an attorney that, that you know, kind of fought for the people, or it was like this, um, you know, it, it was romanticized in my head, right? Because uh, it's a lot harder than these public defenders. I feel bad for them. You know, they have like a thousand cases in like two days to argue them. Um, so it was like romanticized. Uh, I romanticized it to myself. Um, and when I went to law school, uh, I remember thinking my first year of law school, you, you live in a bubble, right? It's like, you know, it's like living in a freaking house together with all these other students. And you, you start to have this herd mentality. And everybody wanted to work at a big firm. And again, so Harvard Spectre, right? And um, I'm like, damn, I want, I want to do that. And I, I, I want to make money to wear a Tom Ford suit, right? Because those are the damn thoughts that I had in my head, right? So um, so I actually changed my mind. I'm like, right, I, want, I want to work at a firm, right? It, it is, it's something where you're like, wow, uh, how, how much is starting salary? $200,000? How much debt do I have? My student loans. Oh, okay. Yeah, I want I want that corporate job. I want to work at that firm in, in New York City, right? And then there's also, uh, you know, this idea that you're, you know, glamorous lifestyle. It's completely the opposite. So during law school, I I, I changed my mind. I, I tried to I tried to get into a law firm, and as time went on, and eventually when I got into my final year of law school, and again this law review that I that I uh, I got to. Uh, work on, um, it it changed my mind again. You know, I went back to my roots. Uh, and it's funny that the director, Shorty, you mentioned um, that student, right? Because she actually had an impact on me as well, right? Um, it was like two, it was actually three L years, my final year in law school. Um, I don't know if I can mention her name, but- uh, You can. S Sabrina Lombardi, I still remember. Um, and, you know, she- uh, we spoke, uh, and she actually reminded me of how important it was to, you know, uh, about my roots in, in school of public affairs administration and why I even went to school of public uh, this uh, spa was because I wanted to be a public uh, service attorney. And she actually reinvigorated me. She kind of motivated me and kind of uh, put my flame back on, my, you know, my fire. Uh, and I, ch I changed my mind and I clerked and and um, yeah, so I so it went back and forth. It, it, it was never static. Um, I changed my mind a lot uh, when it came to my my career, my trajectory. Mm -hmm. 
Danielle, did you have a question? I think I was going to ask about, you know, if there were, uh, is there a case that was most memorable to you, you know, for whatever reason, and um, if you wanted to share a story about that, because I, I feel like your career path is very interesting to me, and you seem like a very inspirational um, a person, and I really admire that. Okay, that's very, very sweet of you. Very kind. Um, no, but thank you guys, honestly. It's really nice to uh, to talk to you guys today, you know. Um, a lot of times in this office, you know, I, I feel overwhelmed, you feel bogged down, and, and every day it's like, all right, I gotta read that. Like, literally, this was my day to, right? Read transcripts and stuff. And you feel like you get stuck in that. And this honestly probably helped me more than it helped you guys. It, it feels, I swear, guys, this is, this is cathartic to me. Um, but so, one of my cases. So when I when I clicked at the appellate division, uh, that's the main reason why I didn't I stopped like like I I this like that was hated litigation was because the appellate division right so the way that the system works in I don't want to bore you guys but the way that the the court system works in New Jersey and most states and federal level is um there's a court there's a trial court superior court in New Jersey in each county and one is designated for a certain area so there's a criminal court there's a civil court there's a um, family court, uh, pension, property, right? These various courts, and they make decisions. And when they get appealed, they come up to the appellate division. That's where I'm working with my judge. And so a lot of my other friends who were clerking, they were working in a family court or a civil court or a criminal court. So they, they got to do that, right? Um, I, I started hating uh, some of my cases because I, would, I, I went, I hated criminal cases. I hated them. Um, I think maybe, you know, I'm a little sensitive or I, I think, I, you know, my, I'm too much of an empath. empath. Uh, I get, I get very upset about some of these cases, but one of the most difficult cases I had was, um, I don't even want to tell you guys about this case, but it, it, it was, a, it was a, a father, um, you know, it was sexual abuse to like a three, four year old daughter. Right. And that to me, I found it incredibly disturbing. Um, but I spoke to the judge about my judge about it. Um, who almost becomes like a you know like a father in a way, right? Uh, and that case was you know it was developmental or pivotal because you know he told me he was like, look, you, you need to be able to turn your emotions off if you want to continue your career at all. Otherwise, you're not going to make it here. You know, um, I think that that's what that's one case that kind of changed my understanding of how to deal with the case. Uh, another case that I worked on, I think, um, cause a lot of the cases that I, that I work on, I'm defending, you know, officers and a lot of times, you know, they're in the wrong, but again, there's, there's a qualified immunity. I'm sure you guys are aware of that. Um, one of the most interesting cases that I had actually, it was the first time I, I love constitutional law. Um, it was a, uh, it was a case where it was at the appellate division. Um, it was a constitutional case. Um, it was regarding uh, double jeopardy, where it's pretty much like you can't be tried um, for the same crime twice, right? But it's way more confusing than that, way more confusing, right? If there's there's different doctrines and constitutional law is difficult because the way that the constitution is interpreted is um, judges will take the text of the constitution, which if you read it, Really doesn't make any sense, right? It's like old English and it's super archaic, right? But they'll they'll take um, writings uh, written by the drafters of the Constitution and try to understand their intent and apply it to the Constitution in today's world, right? So it's it's very convoluted, it's very difficult, but I really enjoyed it. So in this case, you had a criminal defendant. Um, he was locked up, and he got ten he got ten years in jail, right? In the way that the the um, sentencing works in Jersey, there's like consecutive and there's um, consecutive and then there's uh, congruent, right? Uh, and basically, what that means is, if I committed two crimes, right? I robbed the bank and I robbed a uh, jewelry store, and I get tried for the, those both those charges, and I'm found guilty. The judge can either sentence me to um, conse consecutive ten year terms or congruent ten year terms. What that basically means is. 
look, either, you're either gonna you're gonna serve ten, ten years, right, um, for each of these crimes, and you can either serve them together. So you you so like it, it's only ten years, or you serve them consecutively, where you serve ten years for robbing the bank, and then after that's done, you're serving another ten years for robbing a jewelry store, right? Mm -hmm. Now, this case was interesting because the individual, right, it was a pretty horrible crime. He had like a I think, I think he had a brain injury um, and there's something, he was not mentally okay, right? And you can tell because, you know, you have to go through the you know hearings, you go through the transcripts and everything. And, and this guy's representing himself pro se. I was shocked, right? Uh, he's, making the, he's making some of the most intelligent and uh, comp complex arguments I've ever seen. And I wrote a memo on it, right? You write a clerk's memo and you basically say, it's the law judge or to the judges, um this is what these are the facts this is what the record says this is what the case law says and this is and this is my recommendation and uh what i recommended right was the the pro, the pro se uh litigant who was locked up for 10 years his argument was um i should i, sh I should have been um serving make it simple i should i should have been serving a con uh, congruent sentence not a consecutive sentence right Based on a bunch of legal principles, which was a matter of first impression, I mean, it's never been, it's never been dealt with, right? So, you have to kind of the judge has to craft these the analysis on their own, and um, had a lot of fun with that case. And he was pro se, and he actually won. And and uh, in, instead, so he basically got out of jail ten years early, you know. <laughs> so it was just impressive. Yeah, he made these arguments, you know, by himself. I went to law school, and I was clerking at six months at this point and I was having a difficult time and he's crafting these arguments and I'm reading the transcripts and he's arguing for himself and um I thought I found it inspiring uh and it's very very interesting you know um you hear about like jailhouse lawyers they are honestly better than lawyers outside of jail you know who actually are licensed but it's one of the coolest it was one of his most interesting case I've ever won. wow wow okay. So as we come to a close, are there any other questions or comments? I was actually just going to ask, um, this is like so far off of the conversation, but I was going to ask as a lawyer, like, what were your thoughts and opinions about the new appointee in the Supreme Court that just got sworn in? Well, how much time do you guys have? My first question. My question to you guys. You ask the worst question. If you want, if you want to get off this, you ask the worst question. No, that's it. Um, hold on, I'm gonna ask you guys because I've been talking the whole time. What are your guys' thoughts, Monica? You go first, and then go on. I want to hear you guys. Oh, thoughts. I have a million thoughts. I I missed our last meeting because I was in Washington D.C. protesting the whole thing. But, oh, wow, that's pretty cool. <laughs> um, I mean, I knew she had the votes to 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 get sworn in without a problem, but it's just a matter of principle. Mm -hmm. I mean, the whole hypocrisy of the thing, but I was wondering your thoughts as a lawyer, because from my understanding, I mean, I'm not questioning her intellect. I don't agree with her ideals, but I find it interesting that she doesn't seem to have a lot of um, experience in court. It is my right. understanding that she spent most of her career teaching. Right. That's why I was so interested in, in learning your thoughts about that. It's not necessarily about ideology. I mean, you know, we all have our own. I, I, I'm, I'm very much a liberal, but. Um, mm -hmm. But it's just like her career trajectory to lead to like the highest seat on the court in this country. Yeah. Like, how do you feel that as like as a lawyer yourself? So anytime when it comes to judges. It's always politically important, right? So a lot of times these qualif qualifications go out the door, right? There's actually an interesting um, hearing in front of the Senate Judiciary Committee where uh, there is a um, potential, potential judge, right? He's about to be elevated to the circuit court, which is right beneath the Supreme Court, one of the highest courts in the country. Um, there's, there's 11 circuits. And the chairman, I forgot who it was, of the Senate Judiciary Committee, Ask this person a bunch of questions. Hey, do you have you ever been in a deposition before? I literally did five depositions today. And he was going to become a, a very high level. He said no. 
Okay, have you have done a trial before? No. Have you done discovery before? No, these are very basics of motion practice and how the course work, right? Um, because everything is procedural, right? Um, and that judge didn't know anything and he got elevated, right? So based on her experience, I, I know she doesn't have, my, my, my standards for the judges that for the Trump points are incredibly low. Um, it's just something that I had to do to cope with the situation, right? Uh, but she, she is pretty qualified I and mean, she graduated top of her class. Um, I know you said your, your disagreement with her appointment or confirmation now um, was not based on ideology. It's based on experience. Well, it is based on ideology. It is based on the ideology, but also like I was baffled by by her record, like an experience. And yeah, also, right. I guess to add to that, I read like a very uh, in depth article about the fact that since law school, she has been very much groomed by conservative conservative heads to uh, to, you know to to. Um, she was kind of like groomed in those circles, conservative circles. And, and I was just like, is that like common practice, yeah. like in law schools? Like, do you yeah. choose to go to a liberal law school or a conservative law school and then just rub shoulders with important people? A hundred percent. That's, you know, there's that's, a... that's actually how it's done. That is exactly how it's done. Yeah. And wait a minute. So, wait, so I was I, baffled I by that. Wrong, but yeah. when we start talking about access, that is exactly how it is done. That they actually groom people to right. step into those roles that think like them. Like that's right. actually normal practice. And so part of the reason these boards are not as diverse or like the CEOs and the president, like we have a black president, but they're, they're, people of color are not groomed for these positions. So when, you, so when you actually think about behind the scenes backdoor deals, that is exactly like it's normal yeah. operating practice. The, and, you know, and, and the director story is one hundred percent right. It's, it's funny because I, I didn't, I was, I thought the same thing, right? I'm like, all right, look, the judiciary is supposed to be the most neutral place, right? It's not politically motivated. I. After understanding the judiciary more, I think it's the most most politically um, charged uh, branches. Every one of the judges at, at the highest level, they're appointed by the president, right? They're appointed based on their ideology. They're appointed based on how much they're contributing to the Republican Party, whatever party they're in, right? Um, this, this stuff is taken into account. It's completely politically motivated, right? Um, and I, I thought initially, right, uh, maybe it's naive of me, but I thought the judiciary wasn't like that. They just apply the law. It's, it's not true at all. What I've actually come to learn is that the judge made their mind up based on their ideology, based on their political beliefs, right? There's a lot of times that, that I, I will win a case where the officer was coming in the law or whatever it may be. Um, but the judge you know, had, had a certain ideology based you know, on, uh, they made a decision based on their own personal ideology and they will make the law or the opinion or their reasoning fit to that ideology. It, that's, and I, I've only come to learn that recently. And um, yeah, it's, it's actually, it's, it's very shocking. You know, it's, it, but the director is a hundred percent right. It's very politically, very politically charged. I mean, look, a couple of days ago, you had Kavanaugh. Um, and I was shocked about this, right? Because this is actually unconstitutional. Uh, Justice Kavanaugh, right? Um, you guys, I'm sure you guys watched his confirmation, crazy, um, incredibly politically motivated, right? But he said something during the Judiciary Committee uh, in final statement to kind of get back at them. And what he said was, oh, this was a political hit job by the Clintons, right? Um, what, one of the justices that just recently retired, Justice Anthony Kennedy, never speaks to the public. As a justice, you're not supposed to speak to the public. It's actually unconstitutional. In the Constitution, it says, you are not allowed to give a... a a political opinion um, to any uh, members of Congress or, or the executive branch, right, or the Senate. And, and Kavanaugh said a couple of days ago, like, oh, look, if, if, um, if your vote or your, you know, your mail-in ballot comes in after the election day or something like that, it probably won't count. 
He's not supposed to do that by the Constitution. He's not supposed to make a political statement. Uh, the president, you know, uh, can't ask for an opinion from a justice because there's supposed to be separation. But the truth of the matter is, it's not like that. In reality, it's, it's very politically, very, very politically motivated. And, uh, and, and honestly, a judge, uh, they're very skilled in crafting reasoning and don't make these complicated arguments. You read these judicial opinions, like, oh, that's crazy. They'll, they'll make all these logical conclusions, you know, being lawyer, right? That's literally what they do, but they do it to fit their ideology. That's, and that's what I think. Um, that's what I'm starting to learn as it is. So let me say this to you, Azim. First of all, I'm so glad that I followed my intuition to have you speak. So let me say this to you. you we need more lawyers that are in path. We do. Because even if you don't necessarily agree with it, as long as you stay true, that's how things change. That is exactly how things change because you now sit in a position of power to have conversations with those police officers. Like even if it's right. one, like one, one less police officer that decides not to shoot 18 times, that's one less police officer we have to worry about and you know, and in this space, so I always because for me now this work for me, and in my because I'm in a place in my career where this work for me becomes personal, yeah. um, simply because I have a new grandson. And what is good, what I'm watching going on, I think about him. And but I'm not the one that's going to impact the change. Every person in this WebEx will be the ones that will protect him. So my role at this stage of my career and this stage of my life is to open those doors, have those conversations for the next generation to be the lawyers, the directors, the administrators, the policy makers, the decision makers, so my grandson can actually walk free as a black male in America. So as uncomfortable there may be days you may have, I'm glad you're there. Thank you. That was that was incredibly inspiring. That was very, very inspiring. Um, yeah, I'm glad you're there. Um, ambassadors, one word for Azim Aldri as we close out. And I'm gonna run through the list. Sakina, one word. Uh, inspired. Monica, one word. Um, motivated. Mm -hmm. um, Eva, one word. I was actually going to say motivated too, but I'm actually inspired. Thank you. Sir. Samantha, one word. Determined. Yeah. Um, Danielle, one word. I took all of the good ones. Inspired, <laughs> determined, motivated, all of it. Uzva, one close. word. I agree, all of the above, but um, leadership. Yeah. <laughs> so we all close out with one word in leaving, one word into the space, and my one word, Azim, as always, thank you. Oh, that was, that was, you guys are so sweet. But I also want to thank every single one of you. Um, I honestly was inspired by you guys as well. Uh, again, it was, I'm incredibly proud of the School of Public Affairs administration. Um, and I know what we just met, but I'm incredibly proud of you guys. Uh, you guys are the next leaders. Um, you guys are all very well spoken. And stay resilient. You know, mm -hmm. um, what you're doing is so incredibly important, right? And it takes a very, very special person to do what you're doing. It takes a, a certain level of work ethic, it takes a certain level of um, self-actualization and and again I told you I'm an empath right and, and and I know we're virtual and you got you know and I don't know and I just met you guys today but I feel that um, from this discussion that you guys have a strong sense of self-actualization you guys know what you want to do and you know why you want to do it 
can stay resilient. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Be safe.